here we are in uh, the sixth day, beginning with verse 24. Remember, we saw a pattern in the book of Genesis that's really important to us. And the pattern is, Moses set up a pattern. I tell you, when you study the writings of Moses, they're very similar to, to Paul. The way Paul wrote in the Greek is the way Moses wrote in the Hebrew. And once you learn that, because he wrote five books, once you learn that, uh, you learn a great secret when you study any of Moses' writings. And uh, same with Paul. He gives you markers. And one of the pattern markers that Moses gave us in creation was the words God said. He used it on every day. On day three, he used it twice. Now pay attention to me. On day four, he used it four times. Every time he used God said, God introduced a new divine wonder. Something wonderful. When he said, and God said, let there be light, boom, there was light, and it separated the darkness. And every time he said something, something, some divine activity, something wonderful, uh, moving the structure of earth and heaven towards the habitation of the human race on earth. Remember Isaiah 45, 18, a key for us that in Genesis 1, 2, the whole idea was the earth, something had happened between verse 1 and verse 2 to cause the earth to be uninhabitable. Isaiah 45, 18. And other passages that Isaiah was a great writer on that subject matter. And so, God has, remember the first three days of creation is completely different than the last four because the first three days do not have a solar system. And the last three days do have a solar system. And out of the solar systems comes our whole functional star, uh, way of life. Our calendars, our timetables, uh, flying zones, all these kind of things uh, out of that. When he comes to day six, he uses the word God said four times for four divine activities dealing with the completion of the creation for the habitation for man to inhabit the earth. And so, the first time, he, then God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures, that's haya nefesh, that's living souls. After their kind, remember that's really important because day five and day six have haya nefesh, living souls. Everything created has living souls. Nothing prior to that had haya nefesh. It's translating living creatures. That's day five and day six. God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind. You know, on day five, we've got fish and birds. Let the earth bring forth, now we're in day, day six. Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind. That's the Hebrew word men, means, meaning species. The DNA of a species of a specific kind of animal. Then he names cattle and creeping things, and beast of the earth, notice after their kind. That's men, a species, and it was so. God made the beast of the earth after their kind, cattle after their kind, every creeping thing on the ground after their kind, and God saw that it was good. Then God said, let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Now we're into our territory. Let them rule over the fish of the sea. That's day five. Over the cattle, that's day six, and creepy things. God created man in his own image, in the image of God. He created him, male and female, he created them. God blessed them, and God said to them, here we go again, God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful, five imperatives in the Hebrew, five imperatives. This is in the DNA of the human race. See, who, who's he, who, who did he bless? The, now, this is a blessing. He went from, went from uh, making and creating to blessing, and he get, issued five commands. Ma man made in the image according to the likeness of God. That's the DNA. That's what makes man different than animals who are 
after their kind. They reproduce after their kind. All right? Then he says, five commands. He says, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea, the birds of the sky, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. There are five imperatives there. That's part of the human DNA. Then God said, here we go again, behold, remember he has never used this word hina before. This is a brand new word, vocabulary, in the book of, of creation. Behold, I have given you, and so you always pay attention. Let me tell you what it means. Uh, do you see this? This is what the word behold means. Do you see this? Are you getting this? That's what the word behold means in Hebrew. Uh, do you see this? Do you see it? And are you, are you getting it? This is what he's saying. Let us, uh, uh, behold, I have given you every plant yielding seed that is on the surface of the earth, and every tree which fruit has fruit yielding seeds, it shall be what? Food for you. Food for you. That's the first, this is the, the first behold that he's given you about, and you know what that is? Listen to me. Theologically, that's logistical grace. Give us this day or what? That's logistical grace. God has promised, God has promised the human race food. And listen, boy, has he ever, America has always been known after the Depression as what? The food basket of the world. I mean, that's because God. This is God's promise. And to every beast of the earth, and to every bird of the sky, and to everything that moves on the earth which has life, I have given every uh, green plant for food, and it was so. Remember, when you have that little phrase now, that's another one of Moses' patterns. When you see this, and it was so, it means decreed. And decreed takes you back to the Eternal Life Conference. Something that has been decreed has been already has been stated and recorded that's going to come to pass. That's the Eternal Life Conference. That's Ephesians 1.4 called Before the Foundation of the World. That's Paul's interpretation. And God saw, now watch this here, I'm in the final verse. God saw the all he had made, and behold, that's our second behold. What was the first one connected to? Food, which is, means what? Theologically. Logistical grace. Are you with me? That's a big behold. Behold means, do you see it? Do you get it? All right. It... And God saw all that he had made, and behold, it was what? Very good. Didn't say good. It said very good. And, and what did he just say it over? He said very good about what? God saw that all that he created. What is that? Day one, day two, day three, day four, day five, and day six. Agreed? We're at the end when he says, and all that he has made was very good. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, they're all good days. And not just good days, are they? They're what? They're very good days. Hmm? You like that Psalms writing where it says, this is the day the Lord has made. Rejoice and be glad in it. Huh? Yeah, you ought to like that. Let's have a word of prayer and let's... I'm going to show you something really interesting in the Hebrew. Okay? I'm going to show you something really interesting. You can't see it. You cannot see it in the English. It's not, you will never see it in the English, but you will see it in the Hebrew. Father, we thank you today for these that have come our way to study with us. We thank you for a wonderful mission report.
what a wonderful report. About a man and his wife going on a foreign mission trip. And then God sets them down and teaches them about the church. Husband, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And he says, you know, I've been talking about the church this whole time that I've been teaching you, Paul said, on marriage, I've been teaching you about the connection between a man and woman in Christ and believers in the church. So what wonderful lessons you are teaching them about the church and how the church should take care of itself in Christ. And I pray for that. I pray that over their life that something good is about to wonderfully happen in their life. And I pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I don't want to get lost with you today. I, often when I turn to grammar, everybody's eyes roll back in their head and they go like, ah, geez, how am I ever going to use that? I'm going to tell you why I do that. I'm going to tell you why I teach the grammar. Out of respect for Moses, out of respect for Paul, out of respect for Peter, I teach what they taught me. You can't teach what they taught you without the languages. You can't do it. I don't care how good the English is. And so when the writer set up a pattern, Moses sets up patterns just like Paul does. He's a phenomenal writer, Moses. When I got through the book of Genesis, I wanted him to write more on like that. But then, you know, he took me into the Exodus, which was a good book. And then, you know, he took me into the laws. And, <laughs> and people go like, Ugh. But he's a phenomenal writer. And out of respect for him, I must teach what he taught me. And what I'm going to teach you today is very important from Moses' standpoint. And out of respect for his writings, I've got to teach you this. And so you need to be patient with me because it's respect for Moses' writing that I teach what I teach. And so today, I'm going to introduce you into the sixth day, the direct object. Control and tab. Yeah, that's all right. I must have hit the wrong one the first time and said it didn't work. L let me tell you, write this. Nah, I don't want you to clunker. I'll, 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 I'll write on the board the second half. I'll write on the board the second half. I know what I did. I, I, I hit the cap rather than the tab. Um, there is... The sign of the direct object on the sixth day, he does 12 of them. He does 12 of them. Now, when I took my Hebrew, the sign of the direct object was oath, O T H. I'm a, I'll write it on the board in the second half and show it to you. That We would call that vocabulary. And when you saw that, that was what... But in Mo, what Moses did is he used the abbreviated form of oath, O-T-H, to E-T-H. ETH. Now, I, if, if you had a Hebrew Bible, I could point every one of these out to you, okay? So I'm going to point them out in the English to you so you can see where they are. 
Because when he does this, let me tell you what a direct object does. And there, the Hebrews had a sign of it. They, there was a sign. If it, They would attach the abbreviated form. Moses used the abbreviated form ETH. And when he did, he attached it to something that was really, really important. In other words, a doctrinal point or principle. And it's very clear in the Hebrew when you see it and you identify that that's a direct object, accusative, a direct object, accusative state of a direct object, then what, what an accusative or direct object does, what it does, it places emphasis on the subject and the verb. Right? On the subject, you know, the object, when you got the object, you thought, well, where did that come from? Well, it came from the subject, and he did this. You understand? Is it, I'm, I'm talking English to you. See? I'm not talking Hebrew. Right now. I'm just telling you that the Hebrew grammar runs the same way. It, if you have a direct object, it's because it places, it points back to the importance of the subject doing something. The subject and the verb has produced this. Okay? And so, when you have a direct object, it showcases the subject and the verb. So I'm going to show you these. I'm going to show them to you. There's 12 of them. There's 12 of them on day 6. And they give you important doctrinal principles. In number one, I listed all of them that there are. For example, in verse 25, they're used three times. In verse 27, they're used three times. In verse 28, they're used two times. In verse 29 and 30, they're used three times. In verse 31, they're used once. So, do the math quick and see if I got 12. <laughs> you always check my math. All right. Now, remember that when I, when I give you the word oath, that's vocabulary idea of a direct object. What the writer's going to use is ETH. He's going to use the abbreviated form of oath. Okay? It's a little bit of Hebrew, but it's, it's not that bad. Okay? I said to you in point number one, in the Hebrew grammar, because that's what I'm dealing with, the direct object follows the subject and the verb. It points back to showcase them. Together, when you put them all together, you come up with a doctrinal principle regarding the uniqueness of the human soul. Because we're introduced to the human soul, 26, 27, and 28. God said, let us make man in our image, Salim de Muth, in our image according to our likeness. Right? And that's going to, all these 12 things are dealing with man. All 12 of them are dealing with man, and they're dealing with man in the unique. See, man was made with Hayah Nefesh, just like, day five, like the animals on day five and day six, Hayah Nefesh, they have living souls. God breathes into them. And the difference between them is mankind. Mankind is not made after their kind. It's made according to God. Right? Salim de Muth. The image and likeness of the Godhead. Look at, look at, look at verse 20. Look at verse 20. Then God said, Let us make man in our image, Salim, according to our likeness, Demuth, and let them rule over. And then he goes on. He goes on and he talks about it. In verse 27, he uses Bara, very important Hebrew word. God created man in his own image, Salim. In the image of God, Salim, he created him, male and female, he created them. Right? And then he goes on and he talks more about that. The thing that separates the animals from man out of day five and day six 
which both have haya nefesh, living souls, is that man, animals, all the animals, are created under a species called men, M-I-N in the Hebrew. And their whole reproductive system runs on a species concept. Not true with man. Man's is Salim de Booth. Man's soul, whole concept of life, is made in the image according to the likeness of God. All right, we'll talk more about this later, but I'm just kind of showing to you. Well, in verse 25, when you study the Hebrew, as Moses wrote, God made, that's the subject and the verb, a cal imperfect, an oath, or what would be E-T-H, literally, showcase what God had said and what he had made. You know, God said, I'm going to do this, and he, and he works for, for, he says in there, and so God, God made, he made the, the beast, and he, here's what he says, he made the beast, and he put oath, he put, or E-T-H, he put that with the word beast. If in the Hebrew you looked at your Hebrew text, it would have the sign of the direct object on the end of the word beast, as it, or as it introduced it, after their kind, or cattle. He did it again with the word cattle. You see, he's separating categories. He's setting cap categories. Look at beast. They're going to have a whole species of their own. That's the wild animal kingdom. You study that, you see that on Sunday night? Well, oh, okay. Cattle, domestic, after their kind, everything that creeps on the ground, everything has got it on there. See, there's three categories under after their kind. You understand? A whole a whole DNA species concept. And the way to make sure you didn't miss that, that each of these are separate, they're not interchangeable is he puts it down with a direct object that deals with God made the beast, God made the cattle, God made everything that keeps on the creeps on the ground. These are three separate categories of their own species of reproduction. You understand that? Huh? Good. And then it says, and God saw that it was good. So here's a doctrinal point. Jesus, when he was trying to talk to people who lived in a culture like yours and mine today, where everything is going nuts, the way that boils down into the life of believers and unbelievers, when a nation goes road, when they go nuts, it produces in human beings anxiety. Jesus came to minister to the very type of culture that you and I are in with, with one additional factor that they were under the rule of a foreign nation. Everything else was pretty much like we have it today. It was just evil. The whole religious system that were the divine agency of the gospel and growth, spiritual growth, that group that had been given that, which was the priest nation of Israel, and the leadership of the priests and the Levites and the, quote, Pharisees, they were evil. They were so evil, they destroyed the Son of God, their own Messiah. That's eating your own. In the fifth cycle of divine discipline, if you read it carefully, you will see that the most sophisticated of people will eat their young under the fifth cycle of divine discipline. We are close to getting there. We don't have a problem aborting. 
we don't have a problem on either side of birth being destructive to human life. And we are being prepared to eat our own. Think about that. Think about that. You say, I don't think we could ever get that. We're already there. We just haven't got that barbecue yet. We're in a mess. We're in a mess. And listen, Jesus was in a culture like you, yours and mine. And that culture is going to, in the end, do the very thing I said. They're going to eat their own. Forty years after they crucified Christ, they're going to do that. You know, nobody wants to read about it. You've got to go to somebody like Josephus or somebody. The people were full of anxiety from it. Listen, we haven't even began to reach the depth of anxiety that we're headed for. It's in the church. It's certainly in the world. And COVID has set us a spin. Nobody has come out of COVID with a relaxed mental attitude. We're not back to a relaxed mental attitude about life. We should be. That's a God thing, relaxed mental attitude. Uptight and full of anxiety is a devil program. So here's what Jesus told the people to do. <laughs> Look at what he told them. This is. People would think I was nuts. Somebody come to me full of anxiety and boy, we got it. Listen, camp, the camp, the last couple years camps have been just filled with kids full of anxiety. Listen, we got teenagers full of anxiety and don't know why. It's being locked down for two years. That's why. You can't do that with teen, you can't do that with young people. You can't lock them down for two years. Listen, little bitty kids, you know how they identify people and his facial and body expressions. You can't take that away from them. You're going to dwarf them. It's a crazy society. Well, here we are. Listen to this. My New American Standard calls this a cure for anxiety. Watch this. For this reason I say to you, do not worry about your life as to what you will eat, what you will drink, for your body, what you shall put on it, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Listen, he, listen he's full of a, a culture of anxiety. They're uptight, tight, tight. They're wound really tight. Look at the birds. Here's his answer. Look at the birds of the air. That, that's, that, listen, that's day five. That's high on That's day five. He's talking about day five. Look at the birds of the air. They don't sow. They don't reap. They don't gather in barns. And yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? So that's a good question. See, I'm afraid that most people would go, go for the birds. They, get, they would go for the birds. Are you not worth much more than birds? And which of you, then he goes on, which of you being worried can add a, a single hour to your life? Or, or, and he goes through a whole list of things, right? Now watch that. So we, he says, look, you're full of anxiety, you should go do what? What should you do? Here's, Je here's Jesus' therapy session. He says, you're full of anxiety, what's he tell you to do? Go study the birds. And what should you learn from them? They're not anxious. They're not anxious about anything about their life, like you are. Don't you know that you're like, and does God take care of them? 
Does God do? Well, he says they do. I mean, I'm just telling you with Jesus, this is his therapy session. And you, you go like, do I have to pay you for this? He said, no, no, I'm just telling you how to, how to deal with the anxiety. Well, so what, what's his point? His point is, why should you be anxious? Are you not worth more of that? Would God not take more care of you than the birds? Are you not worth much more to him than that, right? Well, I know you don't believe that about your puppy dog and your little cat you go to bed with and all that. I know that. But this is reality. All right, now go to chapter 10. Because he ain't through with the birds. Go to chapter 10. I put it on your paper, 10. It's a good thing I did. Chapter 10, verse 28. He said, don't fear those who can kill the body but are not unable to kill the soul. How you like that one, missionary? How you like that one, missionary? Rather fear him who is able to destroy both the soul and the body in hell. There's your real enemy. Now watch this. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? And yet not one of them will fall to the ground apart from your father? Now, listen, he's saying, look, in man's scheme, not in God, but in man's schemes, two sp you can get two sparrows for a penny. That, that's, on the, that's on the open market. You can get that at Publix. You can buy you can two sparrows. That, I don't know if you've seen sparrows lately, but you're going to have to add a whole lot to that to think you had some meat. You can put them in stew or anything, and you're going to like... Pfft. About all you got's a little, a little something that's giving it a little sparrow taste. That poor man's food, wasn't it? Listen. You wait. You wait, dear people. Tell you will go to the marketplace and buy two sparrows and be glad you could get them. You know what kind of a culture is this? Huh? One in the one in the dumps. The poor man would go out and work a day's earning, and the majority of it would be to buy two sparrows to put something in a pot along with a few vegetables to kind of have something to get by to go to work tomorrow. This is a corrupt culture. This is not the way God designed it. This is the way man wound up with it. Man has created this culture. I, mean, I didn't create that culture. Man created it. I don't know if you know this or not. Billy Graham created two full-length movies. Did you know that? The last one that Billy cr created, I was on the team. Listen to me. It was called Two a Penny. Guess what that was about? <laughs> da -da 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 -da. It was called Two a Penny. I forget what the young guy's name was, but a young actor out of, out of Canada, out of uh, London, played the leading role. It was an outstanding believer. You know who sang the lead? You know what the lead song in that movie was? Ethel Waters sang this wonderful hymn, His Eye is on the what? And he cares so much more for you. Let me tell you, 
The other movie, Billy Graham, full-length movie that he produced was called The Restless Ones. That was created before I got to the team. Both these movies led thousands to Christ. At the end of the movie, Billy would come on and he would give an invitation to be saved in movie theaters. And people would get saved. Where did that come from? It came from the passion of a guy who knew I want to use. Listen, he used to write, he listen, he used to write comic books for Christ when comic books were popular. Did you know that? He wrote comic books for Christ. When little kids wanted to read comic books, he wrote comic books for Christ. A little old southern boy out of Carolina. We need those guys back. Somebody with a passion to take Christ to the public square, to take him into the marketplace, to take him back into the schools. The schools tell you that God spoils the minds, spoils the minds of kids. Therefore, we can't have God in school. How pathetic. And we let them do that on our watch. That day's got to be over. We've got to stand up and give an account for ourselves and our generation. Well, when we come back after a break, I'm going to give you the rest of these and talk about the doctrinal principles that come from them. Let's pray. Our Father, we're thankful today for these that have come our way and what a wonderful report we've heard from the Sextons still on the mission field. We're always on the mission field, Father. We're always on it. We're on a mission field that Jesus Christ returns for us. I pray today that we take this offer and we would use it a little on ourselves and most on reaching the world for Christ. Oh, Father, awaken our souls. Awaken our souls for a spiritual awakening, a spiritual move of God in America to seize it out of the hands of the devil. He is not more powerful than we are. He's a coward. He fights dirty, but he's a coward. He can't stand the truth, and the truth is what separates us. I pray for that. Pray, Father, help us. Take this offering and use it to reach our nation as well as others for Jesus Christ. In his name we've prayed. Amen. I was in point number one. We were we listed all the different places. There, this is this is used on on the man's soul. It's used twelve times, which is a lot. Uh, and we saw uh, under point one that God in verse twenty five, God used it three times when He said uh, God made, and He used eth, of course, the abbreviated form. He added it. It's on beast, it's on cattle, and on uh, everything. It's attached to everything that creeps on the ground. And it's all, and is dealing with day six, is dealing with the things that were created on day six after their kind. In the Hebrew, that's the word men, M I N, and it's referring to a specific species. There was a cattle species of reproduction and. Um, Beast and cattle and everything that creeps on the ground. And then God saw that it was good. Remember, that's everything on day five and day six created 
haya nefesh. Haya is the word for uh, living, life, and then nefesh is the word for soul. Everything created on day five and day six is created with haya nefesh. What separates these two is that they're either cre everything is created on day five and six after the phrase after their kind, which is men in the Hebrew, meaning species, except man. Man was not created that way. Man was not created after his kind. He was created Salim de Muth. It's described Salim de Muth. It's described in the English image according to the likeness of God. It's in Genesis 1, 26, 27, and 28. See, that's very important because, listen, our kids are told that mankind e evolved out of animals into humans. Do you understand that? It's not true. It's a lie from the pit of hell. But nobody studies the Bible anymore, and certainly education doesn't do it. So how do you know that? Well, the Bible, the Word of God says that God created this whole thing. And what this is about, the six days of creation, is about getting an earth inhabited that was not inhabitable in Genesis 1-2. In Genesis 1-2, that's according to Isaiah 45, 18. And so God used six days to get the earth ready to put man on it and to put the animals in the kingdom, the zoos and all that, you know. What was first? The zoo. I mean, they put the zoo. So here's a doctrinal principle that we, were, we studied before we left the first hour. Matthew 6 on your paper. Does everybody have a study guide? If you don't have a study guide, just push your hand up because you'll need a study guide. There's no way you'll ever get this without a study guide. All right, thank you. Well, I'm down on the front page. I'm down in the middle where it says doctrinal principle. Here's the first of six doctrinal principles that's taught by 12 oaths. <laughs> Sounds like uh, midgets or something, doesn't it? And Jesus said, a society or a person that's filled with anxiety should study the birds. Right? And you might say, well, that's for the birds, right? That's for the birds. And so we talked about that. Uh, in, in, in verse 27, this, de listen, the definite article, the, de the direct object, the direct object is used again. It's used three times. Now, th th this on the board is that you can't see it in the English. You have to see it in the Hebrew because Moses wrote in the Hebrew. He didn't write in English. You don't see these markers. These markers are really important. This is, a direct, this is the sign of the direct object, which focuses back on the subject and the verb. It showcases it. So he, so he gave us three of them in verse 25. He gave three of us in verse 27 to emphasize, and he used the word create. Now, there's a difference when God says in the English that God made, that's asa in the Hebrew, asa. When he says he creates, that's bara. The difference is this. The word made, asa, in the Hebrew means to make something out of existing material. Bara means to make something out of non-existing material. It comes out of God himself. Anytime you see the word create, it is normally, it is normally the word bara. Bara means to create something out of nothing. And when you read verse 27, look at verse 20, Genesis 1 27, look at this thing. I know, look, look, it, it's okay. You, you say, well, I've never heard this before. I, I know. I know. I, I can't do anything about that. In verse 27, God created man, that's Ba-Ra. He create, he, God created man in his own image, Salim. The word image is Salim in Hebrew. God created Ba-Ra, man, in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. He used this Ba-Ra again. 
male and female, he created them. <clears throat> you can see how the devil tries to destroy the Word of God today in our culture. I mean, we got, we got somebody going to the Supreme Court that can't give a definition of a woman. If I was a woman, I'd be crazy. Er. I mean, that would drive me. I mean, she can't define. Listen, if I was a woman, I would be appalled that this woman don't know how to define a woman. It means you have no defini definition. They've, they've given you no definition for your life. These are bad, bad people. I hope you know that. I mean, these aren't just, and the, I call them evil. They're beyond bad. I mean, they're trying to, well, anyhow, you know this stuff. But see, verse 27 is really important. God borrowed man in his own image. We've talked about that now. Mankind. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, look, look back on your paper. With the word man, in verse 27, when he used the word man, he added the direct object to the word man, referring to mankind in his own image, Salim. In the image of God, he created him, that, that's, that direct object on him. Male and female, he created them, and he put the direct object on the them. Do you see that? I, so I, ta I put oath right where it belongs in the Hebrew. Now, go to Matthew with me for a moment, and let's talk about this word image. Salim, Salim de Muth. Salim, in Matthew 22, image. In Matthew 22, uh, in verse 17, the disciples are required to pay a tax to Caesar who has conquered them. They have to pay, they've got to pay their own taxes, plus they have to pay Rome taxes. They have to pay Jewish taxes and they have to pay Roman taxes because Rome conquered them. Okay? And so they're going like, well, I don't know that I want to play, pay the Caesar thing. So t tell us then, what do you think? Is it lawful to give poll tax to Caesar or not? The, the tax question. I sh should have saved this for April, shouldn't I? When we're, when we're all disgusted. G but Jesus perceived their malice and said, Why are you testing me, you hypocrites? Show me a coin. Show me the coin used for the poll tax. And so they brought him a den denarius. He said, Whose image is on it? He said to them, Whose image or whose likeness and inscription is this? They said to him, Caesar's. Tiberius's. Then he said to them, Then render to Caesar that which is Caesar's and to God that which is God. Now, whose image are you created in? <clears throat> Agreed with that? Well, I don't know if you like it or not, but you are. <laughs> We're all created in the image according to the likeness of God. See, whatever the image was, on one side was the image, then the inscription, you know, like in God we trust, the inscription, and on the back side would, would, would be the the emperor or, or, or the whatever office he held or whatever it was. Be, be the supreme ruler of the Roman Empire. See? So, is that, is that well, look, he, Caesar's got a tax. Now, this is not asking you to give money to God, Okay? It's telling you to understand who the image you're made in. You give to God, it, listen, 
Caesar conquered you because you gave your nation up. Right? Nobody's bigger than God. They, they, they could, they, God let them take the uh, Israel over. This is, it's, they were under the fourth cycle of divine discipline headed to the fifth. It is a, look, you gave your nation away to a foreign power. You paid taxes to them. But don't forget who your image you're made in. You give to God the things that are God because you belong to God. You don't belong to Caesar. In your, in your worst day, you don't belong to Caesar. In your best day, you don't belong to Caesar. You don't belong to Caesar. You belong to God. You gave up your nation. You're subject to him because you, you, you laid down your sword because you didn't have any reason to fight for a great nation. See, that's what I worry about. All this wokeness is take your weapon out of your hand to take the young men and tell them, well, you, you know, we're, we're not a military fights to win. What a sad day that would be in America. And that's, a, that's that woke business in the military. Let me tell you that. You haven't seen the half of this. You haven't seen the half of it. Doctrinal principle from this idea of Selim to Muth, image according to likeness. A doctrinal principle comes out of this. Selim to Muth shows that the uniqueness of the human soul is being created out of the essence of God's, the Godhead, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit are all going to look alike. There are three different persons with the same absolute essence of divinity with different functions. There's God the Father, there's God the Son, and there's God the Holy Spirit. They have one essence, but three of three distinct persons with three distinct functions. They call that to Trinity in some cor corners. Well, Salim Dulu shows the uniqueness of the human soul being created out of the essence of God. Here's a great verse in your spare time this week. Read Psalms 8. Read Psalms 8, 1 through 9, later, not now, which is quoted by the writer of Hebrews. It's quoted by the writer of Hebrews in Hebrews 2, 5 through 11, and has everything to do with the creation of man's soul in the image according to the likeness of God. It's a great study. Also, I would recommend you, for you to read Psalms 136, 1 through 9. Because he talks about, there's a theme in it, a pattern. A pattern for study. And the pattern for study, you'll recognize it. His loving kindness is everlasting. And the first nine verses you should read because you're in it. You are in it. When we get to verse 28, we have this word oath that's used again two times. It's with the word God blessed. This is the word in the Hebrew, barak. Barak is used in the PL to show, the, to show you the heart of God towards you. PL, it's an intensive stem in the Hebrew to show you the desire and the heart of God and what he's willing to do for you. It's the PL in the Hebrew. God blessed them, and notice that the word oath is the direct object, is with the word them. And God blessed them. Who is the them? That's the end of verse 27. Male and female. God blessed them. See, that's the same them. It's the same them as in verse 27. Oath showcases a pronounced divine blessing on the human race. It is here in verse 28. Let me get back to it and remind you that it is in verse 28 that we have these five. In verse 28, God blessed them and he gave them five commands in the Hebrew. These are imperative moods. 
These are five commands. This is part of, the, listen to me, this is part of the creation DNA package of Salim Demuth in the human soul. When it says in verse 28, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, and rule over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the sky. See, that's James. James writes about this in the third chapter, 7 through 10. And he says that man has been given the authority by God over animals to tame them. He used the word tame. And he said it's unfortunate that he don't know how to control his own tongue. You remember that? Yeah. I'm meddling now, ain't I? Eh? I've left teaching and started meddling. Well, James did. I blame James. Eh, I wouldn't do that. I blame him. Look. Look. Third, third divine principle. Third doctrinal principle. God issued, God issued five commands into the DNA of the Salim de Muth instead of after their kind. We have Salim de Muth for the human race, right? He, he put five imperatives into the DNA of the human race. They're, they're well worth your study. I wrote them down in P words. Procreate, progeny, populate, prevail, power. In verses 29 and 30, he uses oath again three times. This time with God said, remember that the direct object always points back to what, whatever God is doing. If, is it, if he's making, then that's important to what he's saying here. Is he blessing? That's important to what the, what's being directed, right? If he says... So you always pay attention to God as the subject and the verb and then the direct object. You're part of, here's what God's doing in the direct object for your life and my life. God has spoken, God has made it, God has blessed it, right? You always pay attention to that. You always pay attention to it. When we get into verse 29 and 30, we, we're into a, a section called God said in Callum Perfect. Oath showcases what God promised to do for the human race. The word behold is used twice. Once in verse 29 and once in 31. The word behold. We have never seen this word before in, the, in Genesis. Hedon, the Hebrew word for behold, it carries the idea to cause you to stop and ask yourself, do you see it? Are you getting it? Do, are you getting what God has done for you to make you a human being? Are, do you understand how you differ from the other areas of creation on day five and six that have Haya Nefesh, living souls? Do, do you understand? Are you getting it? Do you see it? That's the word behold. That's the word behold in the Hebrew. And then he says in, in this verse, he says, I have given you every green plant, which is an herb idea, herbal idea, and he uses the word oath. So he puts the direct object on it, the, the sign of the direct object. Every tree, that's every fruit tree, he put the, direct, the sign of direct object on it which has fruit yielding seed, watch this, it shall be food for you. Now write this next to that. It's, it's going to be food for you. That's logistical grace. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as, as, it, as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. He's promised it to you. Do you understand that? He's promised it to you. He's promised it to everything that has Haya Nefesh in it, that is a living soul. Everything on day five and day six has been promised by God to do this, right? He's, he told you, look at the birds. It shall be food for you. 
Now, write this. Did you write logistical grace? Logistical grace means that God will take care of your what? Needs. Now, write this down. Philippians 4.19. That's a big verse for you. Write down Philippians 4.19. That's a big verse for you. Because Paul is giving you a promise in 4.19 that goes all the way back here to Genesis. It's a documented promise that God will provide for your needs. It's part of your DNA package, but you got to believe it. In verse 30, he reviews day 5 and 6. In verse 30, he, he talks about the beast, the birds, the things that move on the earth. See, he put birds in there because that comes from day five. Everything day five and six. And then he gives the third oath in verses 29 through 30. He says, I have given every green plant, and he uses the word oath, for food, and so it was decreed. In other words, somewhere God had stated that and, and as a decree. And here's where it's come to pass. And so it what? Wait, and so it what? And so it was. And it was so. Listen, you say eternal life. I've never heard of an eternal life conference. I know. Because you didn't pay any attention when you read Ephesians 1.4. Um, one among many passages in the New Testament says that there were certain things, for example, even your identity in Christ. Well, let me show you something. I said, nothing like putting your eyes on the Word of God, is there? Nothing like it. Ephesians, watch this, Ephesians 1 4. Just as He chose us in Christ, before the foundation of the world. I was chosen in Christ before the foundation. What is the foundation of the world? It's creation. There was a conference held in eternity past. We call it, in theology, we call it the eternal life conference where God set out everything that you find in the Bible was outlined and established. And it now is coming to pass starting with Genesis and goes all the way to the coming of the Son of Christ the first time, all the way over to the second coming of Christ, all that that is decreed in this book was decreed way back there in eternity past when God laid it all out. And it caused the revolt of Satan against it. Because God said the centerpiece of this whole book is going to be Jesus Christ. And the devil went, that I'm not part, I'm not part of it. And he said, well, so be it. You'll be part of it. And so he is. Chapter 20. You can find out what the end of Satan. Well, anyhow. Doctrine and principle. God has decreed a promise to provide logistical grace to the, all the animals and all of mankind for all of their days on earth. He said, as I well, I don't know where we're going to get it for tomorrow. What, what, well, look, he'll, he'll, give you, he'll, he'll give you food for sure, right? I was a farm kid, so for me, he taught me how to plant something. <laughs> then he taught me how to can something. So when I couldn't have anything in the winter, I had something because God gave me enough sense to figure that out. So I was raised in Michigan. That's you got to harvest anything in the winter. Uh, well, fish, deer, a few things like that. You know, the things you can harvest, they then going to be vegetables. Well, anyhow, I love this Philippians four, nineteen, Second Corinthians twelve. Listen, takes us a step further. For my dear brother, Mr. Sexton. It's because it 
it gives a promise to undeserved suffering. And boy, this is a tough one. Because undeserved suffering is every minute of every day, of every week, of every year. Especially if it's the thorn in the flesh. There is no relief apart from God. And the relief that comes from God is to be assured that you know why He's doing what He's doing. And here's what Paul writes. He writes, My grace is sufficient. You know what sufficient means? Now listen to me. It don't mean a lot. It don't mean much. Here's what it means. It means enough. Enough for that minute of the day. Enough for that hour. Enough for that, that week. Enough for whatever. It's just enough. And what does sufficient provide? Listen to me. Here's what it must always provide. Praise to God Almighty. He could have let you out the easy way. He could have let you go into sleep one night, not wake up except in heaven. Could have done that. Right? For some, he didn't. For some, he does. Listen, God doesn't put anything bad in your life because Romans 8, 28 says, all things work together for... You've got to remember that. But it's the good for God. It's not necessarily the good for you. But it is the good for God. It's a gift. It's a sacrificial offering. It's a Romans 12, 1 and 2. It's living that transformational life that offers yourself as a living, holy sacrifice to God. We need to be prepared to do that now. You need to prepare your soul for that journey. It may never come to your life, but it may. And let me tell you, it'll be a glorious thing in eternity. You got to keep your wits about you here. You got to keep your wits about you here. You can't get caught up in the suffering. Listen to me now. You got to get caught up in the sufficiency. Please tell me you know that. Dear hearts, if you don't know that, you're going to be miserable. You're going to cry every night and pull your hair out and pray to God to die. When God wants you to live and bring honor to his name and touch people's life that you would have never touched any other way but suffering. Don't focus on the suffering, Paul says. Focus on the sufficiency. Say sufficiency. My grace is sufficient. My wife, this was her verse. We talked about it every day. We prayed it over day. For years. And I would say to her, it's not the suffering, honey. It's the sufficiency. My grace is sufficient. It's always enough to get you by the hour, the minute, the moment. It's always enough. And you've got to prove that to me. You've got to prove that to me. What a wonderful journey. What a wonderful journey. You've got to understand this stuff. 
God has his best desire of his best heart for you, no matter what you're going through. And whatever you're going through is all part of it. You got to focus on the right stuff. And then this is a wonderful passage, 2 Corinthians 12. And he wants you to focus on my grace is sufficient, not your suffering. You need to help other people in it with that kind of thinking. It's what stabilizes them. It's what gives them it's, it's what gives them hope for the day they have. They go like, oh, I know what's coming today. I know it's going to be like this. I know, but look. You know, I'm going to close with this, but. When we had Jane's mother in our home for her passing, a red cardinal would come every morning and sit in a tree in front of her window. And Jane would go in and read Matthew 6 to her, study the birds. And it would bring such comfort to her mother who was going through undeserved suffering as well. Mrs. Jones died. We didn't see the cardinal again. Jane's sister got really sick, and so we took Jane's sister in, put her in the same room, which was the best room in the house, for her departure. The cardinal showed up. That little red bird showed up every day, every morning, until she died. When she died, we didn't see the bird anymore. My mother came to live with us in her last days. We put her in the same room. Guess who showed up? That red cardinal. And that red cardinal came every day and it brought, her, it brought everybody such great love and hope. And they looked forward every morning to that bird. And that, every morning that bird showed up. I mean, it was just faithful. And then she died. And we didn't see the bird anymore. You know, went a pretty good while before my wife Jane got ill. And of course, it became her room. Do you know how, how hard it was after that to get anybody to sleep in that room? <laughs> <laughs> it was the nicest room in the house with its own bathroom and everything, but boy, you couldn't get anybody in my family. Ah! Uh -uh. <laughs> Jane went through a pretty good hitch of illness. That bird shut up every morning. That red canary or whatever, that cardinal, cardinal showed up every, every day until she died. And that's something. And that's something. So when I read a passage like Matthew 6, study of the birds, it has a whole different meaning to me in my life. It has a whole different meaning. Father, we're so thankful. For these that have come and stayed attention with us, I know that for many, grammar would be boring. But for me, I have to honor Moses. Went to all the trouble to write that in such a magnificent way and laid it out with such doctrinal emphasis. How could I not study it? So I pay tribute to that. What a marvelous writer was Moses. He doesn't get the credit he deserves. 
I know it was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. I understand the inspiration of the scriptures and I am thankful for it. And I pray that has come out today in the way we've tried to bring the light of the languages that Moses laid it out so magnificently 12 times to give us six great principles of doctrine that focuses on the magnificence of God's grace. How could we not praise you and thank you for such a wonderful creation? It must be greater than I can imagine because it is God who said it was very good. <laughs> very good. I don't know, boy, when God says very good, it's got to be something lights out. So I'm thankful for it. We're a troubled nation, Father, as you well know. We, the Church of Jesus Christ, is be, has got to be on our game. We cannot, be, we cannot afford to be pushed around one more day by evil and the way it thinks and the way it harms. It's about the devil wants to shut out, blow out the light of Jesus Christ in our nation. And we must not permit it. Give us the courage to make a strong stand, Father, in America. Because we have a group of people, Father, out to destroy it, and they've made it clear. They're not talking behind the, the walls anymore. They're not talking in the private offices. They're, they're, they're shouting from the housetops that they're coming for us. Let's beat it. We want them converted. It changed my heart. We want them converted. I don't want them destroyed. I want them saved. So we've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.